This is Audible. Bass Reeves, The Life and Legacy of the Wild West's First Black Deputy Marshal. Written by Charles River Editors. Narrated by Ray Howard. Introduction My mom always said she heard Bass was so tough he could spit on a brick and bust it in two. Attributed to Willabelle Schultz, granddaughter of Reeves's colleague. Exploration of the early American West, beginning with Lewis and Clark's transcontinental trek at the behest of President Thomas Jefferson, was not accomplished by standing armies, the era's new steam train technology, or by way of land grabs. These came later, but not until pathways known only to a few of the land's indigenous people were discovered, carved out, and charted in an area stretching from the eastern Rocky Mountains to the Pacific Ocean and the present-day borders of Mexico and Canada. Even the great survey parties, such as Colonel William Powell's exploration of the Colorado River, came decades later. The first views of the West's enormity by white Americans were seen by individuals of an entirely different personality, in an era that could only exist apart from its home civilization. In the span of scarcely more than a half a century, the West developed from a handful of scattered fur-trapping enterprises, predominantly inhabited by males, to a region full of burgeoning rustic communities, and, before the government's official closure of the frontier as a lawless expanse, Western societies were essentially living apart from traditional American rule of law. What judicial structures were at work across the West were erratic, often willing to exercise extremes without evidential justification, and manipulated by major corporate interests of the day, most notably cattle. Explorers, soldiers, and settlers of African-American heritage comprise an unfamiliar story to most students of American history. However, in the push westward, they were present in sufficient enough numbers to exert great influence on the nation's development. Among the earliest accounts is that of Isabel de Olvera, who settled in New Mexico around the year 1600, and it is estimated that by 1750, 25% of Albuquerque's population shared discernible African ancestry. York, the well-known servant of Lewis and Clark, accompanied the legendary expedition under the auspices of the Jefferson administration, and Edward Rose traveled up the Missouri River in the same era. Within just a few years, Pio Pico became the governor of California, and George Bush became one of the first black men to travel the Oregon Trail, opening that route to a flood of settlers over a ten-year period. In parallel with these individuals came a number of black frontiersmen who participated in the exploration of the western terrain, said to have numbered in the dozens. Seldom heard but notable names of black figures in the West include trick rodeo rider Jesse Stahl, stunt rider and cattle rustler Ned Huddleston, and Bass Reeves, the first black deputy U.S. Marshal. Isom Dart and Willie Bill Pickett also garnered some fame in the era. Furthermore, given the segregated nature of society, it was all the more shocking that Reeves reached such a position in law enforcement. The region was known for infamous outlaws and gangs, but numerous icons in the form of tin star-bearing, gun-toting lawmen emerged, sworn to round up these anarchic and violent desperadoes and bring them to justice, dead or alive. Some of them are still well known today, such as Wyatt Earp and Sheriff Pat Garrett, a former cowboy, bartender, and customs agent best known for his slaying of Billy the Kid. Bill Tillman, a prolific peace officer and member of the Three Guardsmen, along with Chris Madsen and Heck Thomas, cemented his place in history when he apprehended the elusive bandit outlaw Bill Doolin, a one-time member of the Dalton Gang and later head of the Wild Bunch. Deputy Marshal Heck Thomas himself was hailed as one of the most accomplished lawmen of the West in his own right, squaring off with and playing a hand in the arrests of dozens of marauders and murderers, including several members of the Sam Bass Gang, as well as Jim and Pink Lee of the notorious Lee Gang. The famously indomitable Bass Reeves was a man of mystery. 
Although his peerless reputation and near-flawless track record often preceded him, this mountain of a man, both literally and figuratively, had a gift for blending in and creeping up on his targets unnoticed. His strategic anonymity aside, Reeves was an ambidextrous and unparalleled marksman, powered by blinkered and tireless determination, and stopped at nothing to fulfill every last one of his objectives. Reeves went on to terrorize villainous outlaws and serial lawbreakers across the Indian Territory for thirty-two years, and became such a household name that even crooning jailbirds sang songs about the lawman. Even more impressive, Reeves supposedly struck such terror into the hearts of desperados everywhere that he haunted them in their sleep. One article published by the Chickasha Daily Express on August 3, 1903, tells the story of one Jerry McIntosh who, in a drunken rage, had dragged his wife out of bed, doused her in coal oil, and set her alight. The woman suffered horrible third-degree burns and was deemed to be in critical condition with little hope of recovery. When McIntosh laid his head to rest that evening, he dreamt that he was being chased by a vengeful Reeves on horseback and awoke in a puddle of sweat. The following morning the abusive husband turned himself in to the police. Of course, while Reeves's stunning feats were undoubtedly remarkable and more than worthy of the silver screen, his accomplishments were made all the more outstanding by the color of his skin, particularly during a time in which racial discrimination was the norm. Bass Reeves, the life and legacy of the Wild West's first black deputy marshal, chronicles Reeves' life and career in law enforcement and how his legend has endured. Come Hell or High Water The still of the umbrous clearing near Keokuk Falls, Oklahoma, illuminated only by the pale glow of the moonlight, was splintered by the slow and stealthy yet heavy footsteps. A shadowy figure plodded toward the nondescript log cabin, the ferule of his worn cane silently piercing the marshy path. He balled his large fist and proceeded to knock on the door three times, waiting patiently as the quiet cabin stirred to life. An unshaven man opened the door and peered out into the darkness, brightening the front porch with the oil lamp in his hand. A wave of relief visibly washed over him at the sight of the unannounced visitor, a mustachioed, broad-shouldered farmer, clad in ragged overalls and a shabby straw hat. The farmer stroke in a low timbre, a gravelly voice that caught him off guard, but the stranger's unassuming demeanor softened his vigilance. He was sorry to wake him, the farmer explained, but his old ox cart had gotten stuck on a tree stump just around the corner of the cabin, and he could not afford to desert his only means of transport, nor could he abandon his precious oxen. The man, along with his three other companions who were listening intently to the dialogue behind him, wavered for a moment but not wanting to attract any more attention to what was in reality their hideout, and noting the distress on the poor farmer's face, elected to follow the grateful farmer to the scene of the accident so as to, in their words, get the black hick going on his way. The farmer stepped off to the side and allowed the grunting men to free his ox cart from the protruding stump. Unbeknownst to the men, the stranger in need was no farmer at all but a seasoned deputy U.S. marshal. What's more, this was no run-of-the-mill law officer. He was the one and only Bass Reeves, and he was fully aware of their true identities. The foursome were, in fact, wanted men who had earlier that week robbed a trading post clean at gunpoint. Only when the oblivious men had hauled the cart off the stump did they find themselves staring down the barrels of the farmer's Colt forty-five pistols. The jig was up. Perhaps having heard of the crack shot's legendary abilities, the four men swallowed their fates and allowed the lawman to handcuff them to the ox cart with little resistance. With the men chained up, Reeves entered the cabin, retrieved the stolen loot, and loaded it onto his cart before heading southwest to Tecumseh, forcing the wanted men to walk for the entirety of the twenty-eight mile journey. There he dropped the fugitives off at the county sheriff's office, collected his well-deserved bounty, returned the ox cart and oxen to a local rancher, hopped onto his prize white stallion, and trotted off into the distance. The capture of the four fugitives in Keokuk Falls is only one of the many tales in the rich tapestry of Bass Reeves' lore.
As might be expected from a man who embodied a riddle wrapped in an enigma, the specifics pertaining to Bass Reeves's childhood remain a matter of debate. In some accounts, his birthplace is listed as Crawford County, Arkansas. In others, Reeves is said to have been born in Paris, Texas. In the same vein, his exact date of birth remains a mystery, though most historians have narrowed it down to sometime in July of 1838. Reeves, named after his maternal grandfather, Bass Washington, was the second son born to J. M. Stewart and Paralee Washington Stewart. Little else is known about the patriarch and firstborn of the Stewart family. Paralee, who was only seventeen when she bore her second child, and her children were slaves belonging to William Steele Reeves, a Pendleton, South Carolina native and esteemed bureaucrat who previously served in the Tennessee State Legislature before relocating to Arkansas, where he assumed similar duties. As per tradition, Paralee's children were made to adopt the surname of their master. In 1846, Reeves's master prepared an escort and a wagon, loaded it with what few belongings Paralee and her sons had to their name, and sent the foursome to the estate of his son, Colonel George Robertson Reeves, in Grayson County, Texas. Upon his arrival, the eight-year-old Reeves was appointed personal butler to the colonel, who, in addition to his sheriff duties, was employed as a state legislator, tax collector, and speaker of the House of Representatives. Paralee and her sons would go on to cater to the whims and fancies of their new master, along with his wife, Jane Moore, and their twelve children, for several years. Reeves, like many other enslaved children, was not exempt from the lengthy list of labor-intensive chores. In addition to valeting, Reeves served as a water boy, tasked with fetching pails of water for the other slaves, and he was often posted at the entrance of the estate, where he was made to open and shut the heavy gate as his masters came and went. His routine also consisted of washing dishes, food prep, scrubbing floors, polishing furniture, and gardening. In his early teens he was promoted to blacksmith's apprentice and stable hand. At the crack of dawn each morning, he dutifully fed chickens, collected a basket full of eggs, and steered the colonel's cows to pasture. Moreover, like other enslaved children, Reeves never learned to read or write, and he remained largely illiterate for the rest of his life. In place of reading, writing, and other rudiments of basic education, his mother, a deeply devout Christian, recited and interpreted scripture, and as a result he too became deeply religious. Nevertheless, what Reeves lacked in book smarts he made up for in street smarts. He was fiercely intelligent, a fast learner, and keenly observant of his surroundings. Not much else is known about Reeves's formative years, and he was understandably reticent about one of the most harrowing periods of his life. That being said, one can paint a vague picture of his miserable quality of life, judging by the living standards of nineteenth-century slaves. He was most likely malnourished. His diet was presumably composed of milk mixed with bread, occasionally enriched with molasses, cornbread paired with pot liquor, a kind of vegetable-based broth, and leftovers. He would have been dressed in tattered one-piece garments with no undergarments, and perhaps a pair of sheer leggings to combat the frost in winter. He would have been made to sleep on a makeshift ticking, stuffed with grass, hay, pine needles, and corn shucks, and he had no other option but to relieve himself in a bucket. Worse yet, he was in all likelihood subject to gruesome corporal punishments, which would have included being whipped with scourges or beaten with paddles, clothing irons, and other blunt instruments. At the age of twenty-four, Reeves, not unlike many of his fellow slaves, was called to serve alongside his master in the American Civil War, and, not unexpectedly, reports regarding Reeves's involvement in the war vary. In most biographies, Reeves, who was enlisted as a soldier in the Confederacy, was placed in the Battle of Pea Ridge in Arkansas in March of 1862, the Battle of Chickamauga in Georgia in September 1863, and the Battle of Missionary Ridge in Chattanooga, Tennessee, in November 1863. According to other sources, Reeves had been recruited by the Northern Union Indian Home Guards, three regiments comprised of Creek, Cherokee, and Seminole soldiers. The former accounts seem more probable, 
as his master served as a colonel in the 11th Texas Cavalry of the Confederacy. Whether Reeves actually fought at Chickamauga and Missionary Ridge is another bone of contention. Reeves' relatives asserted that he had made his pivotal break for freedom sometime in the spring of 1862, but the events leading up to his escape are unclear. In one oft-repeated account, the colonel flew off the handle when he lost to Reeves in a game of poker one evening and proceeded to take a swing at the victor. Reeves instinctively clocked the colonel in self-defense, knocking him out cold. Seizing the moment, the quick-thinking Reeves grabbed his satchel, mounted the unconscious colonel's stallion, and hightailed it into the night. In a second account, Reeves had himself blown his stack when he found the colonel beating his mother, whereupon he grabbed a steel garden spade and struck his master, killing him with a single blow. The second account, however, is easily refuted, as George Reeves lived for another two decades, until he was bitten by a rabid dog and succumbed to ensuing complications in 1882. In a third account, Reeves had been tethered to a fence as a disciplinary measure following an altercation with the colonel when an unidentified good Samaritan, who chanced upon him in the middle of the night, cut him loose, allowing him to flee. Whatever the case, Reeves wound up in the heart of Indian territory, and he was greeted by the warm acceptance of the local Cherokee, Creek, and Seminole tribes. As dictated by the controversial Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, all American citizens, including inhabitants of free states, were required to return all escaped slaves to their rightful owners. Fortunately for Reeves, Native American tribal territories did not adhere to these laws, thereby making the Indian Territory a safe haven for escaped slaves. Reeves not only respected but acculturated to life among the Indian tribes, familiarizing himself with and absorbing their customs and traditions, as well as enhancing his tracking, hunting, and equestrian skills. He mastered five tribal languages along the way, becoming fluent in Muscogee and conversational in Choctaw, Cherokee, Chickasaw, and Creek dialects. He later said, The Indians, they was mighty good to me. I was proud to gain their trust. It was also at this time that Reeves stumbled upon his natural aptitude for firearms, and he became quite experienced with various guns. The countless hours he spent firing at homemade targets and executing drills, honing his exquisite accuracy and sharpening his celerity, yielded much fruit. He took the time to acquire an intimate knowledge of himself as a marksman, and he perfected his shooting style. Although he could draw and shoot from the hip with exemplary precision— he was supposedly capable of drawing a bead as fine as a spider's web on a frosty morning. He preferred not to rush himself, valuing precision and timing over power and speed. Reeves was unquestionably one of, if not the most proficient sharpshooter in the tribal regions. He was reportedly such a crackerjack shot that he was prohibited from partaking in any of the local turkey shooting competitions. Turkey shooting, a popular sport in those parts, particularly among the Seminole tribes, entailed trussing up a turkey and hanging the fowl upside down on a clothesline. Contestants on horseback were tasked with blowing the head off the said turkey while charging down the line at full speed. Another account that demonstrates his brilliant marksmanship sees Reeves coming to the aid of a hapless steer feebly fending off a pack of six wolves. The unflinching sharpshooter mounted his stallion and swooped down on the wolves, eliminating every one of them with no more than eight shots. Ever the humble soul, Reeves always declined to accept compliments regarding his shooting skills, maintaining that he was merely a fair shooter. With the institution of the Emancipation Proclamation in January 1863, Reeves was at long last a free man. Relishing his fresh lease on life, Reeves bade farewell to his gracious keepers and relocated to Van Buren, Arkansas, where he purchased a small plot of land and assembled from scratch a modest two-story home equipped with eight rooms. He came upon and soon wedded the love of his life a few months later, a statuesque and soft-spoken Creek woman named Nellie Jenny, who was two years his junior. His darling bride bore him seven boys and four girls, Robert, Benjamin, Newland, Homer, Edgar, George, Bass Jr., Lula, Sally, Harriet, and Alice. The bulk of Reeves's relatively stable income was derived from his work as a farmer and rancher, but he also moonlighted as a contract guide and scout 
for the local U.S. Marshal's office. He used the knowledge he had amassed in hunting and tracing, and he tapped into his arsenal of tribal languages and connections to track down fugitives and to deliver warrants. Reeves, as he himself put it, was as familiar with the Indian territory as a cook was with her kitchen. In 1871, the federal court and headquarters of the Western District of Arkansas were transferred from Van Buren to Fort Smith, roughly 5.5 miles southwest. On March 19, 1875, Isaac Charles Parker, hand-picked by President Ulysses S. Grant, was designated as judge of the Federal Western District Court, which presided over the Indian Territory. U.S. Marshal James Fleming Fagan was sworn into office shortly thereafter, and he was then instructed to recruit 200 new deputies as part of the new campaign to curtail the region's alarming crime rate. Fagan scoured the land for potential recruits, and before long he made an acquaintance with Reeves, who was vigorously endorsed by the locals. Awed by Reeves' expertise in both tracking and shooting, as well as his lingual abilities, Fagan deemed him a perfect fit and offered him a job on May 10th that same year. Reeves accepted, and the 37-year-old was thenceforth known as the first black deputy U.S. marshal in the region. His jurisdiction encompassed not only the Indian Territory, but the better part of western Arkansas, including Anadarko and Forts Sill and Reno, an incredibly extensive scope measuring some 75,000 square miles. Reeves was wholly cognizant of the precariousness and perils that came with this line of work. Statistics show that deputy marshals were especially vulnerable in the Indian Territory. On April 15, 1872, eight deputy marshals involved in an impromptu shootout with several Cherokee gunslingers in Tahlequah were killed in an episode now remembered as the Going Snake Massacre. Thirteen years later, a gun battle that pitted local officers against the Pink Lee Gang in Delaware Bend resulted in the deaths of Deputy Marshal Jim Guy and three of his posse. Ted Calhoun, a former curator and historian for the Marshal's Service, estimated that at least 103 deputy marshals were killed in the line of duty between the years of 1872 and 1896, which far exceeded the mortality rates of deputy marshals in other regions. Undeterred, Reeves was resolved to tame the Wild West, and he set out to do just that. A 1907 article, published by an Oklahoman newspaper, summed up the situation succinctly. Eighty miles west of Fort Smith, it was known as the Dead Line, and whenever a deputy marshal from Fort Smith crossed the Missouri, Kansas, and Texas track, he took his life into his hands, and he knew it. On nearly every trail would be found posted by outlaws a small card warning certain deputies that if they ever crossed the dead line, they would be killed. Reeves had a dozen of these cards, which were posted for his special benefit, and in those days such a notice was no idle boast. The Reeves Method Reeves was never known to show the slightest excitement under any circumstances. He does not know what fear is. Place a warrant for arrest in his hands, and no circumstance can cause him to deviate. Excerpt from the Oklahoma City Weekly Times Journal, 1907 Reeves took great pride in his new line of work. Not one to cut corners, he made certain to educate himself on the different territorial laws and jurisdictional red tape. He learned, for instance, that a deputy marshal could only apprehend Native Americans accused of committing a crime against a white or black citizen, while Native Americans who committed crimes against their fellow tribesmen, on the other hand, were beyond his sphere of authority. The deadline was clearly delineated for him, with the fringes marked by the Missouri-Kansas-Texas railroad tracks. While a deputy marshal's chief objective was to smoke out and serve warrants to wanted felons, he was also vested with the power to arrest those caught breaking the law red-handed, for crimes ranging from murder and arson to theft and incest on the spot. Deputy marshals, like guides and scouts, were contract employees, meaning they were paid per warrant delivered. Unlike guides and trackers, however, marshals were also compensated with an additional daily stipend and they were also reimbursed for the food and drink they provided for the prisoners during their transport. 
In general, deputy marshals were allotted a period of 30 days to serve their warrants and retrieve their charges, a cap implemented to prevent those officers from abusing the policy of daily stipends. As prescribed by federal law, activated deputy marshals were also required to be in the company of at least one posse man. Trips prolonged by distance as well as the issuing of multiple warrants required a chuck wagon, a wagon with built-in cooking facilities, a tumbleweed wagon, closed wagons with barred windows so as to serve as a temporary jail cell, and a larger posse which typically consisted of a cook and one or two posse men who served as backups. Each member of the posse was expected to be trained in the use of firearms and effectively to ward off wanted men and opportunistic thieves that struck in the dead of night. Reeves's posse men were also occasionally expected to play the role of bait. When pursuing bootleggers, for example, one of his posse men, posing as an inebriated vagrant, staggered onto the path of passing bootleggers. The posse man would then request a few bottles of moonshine from the bootleggers while dangling a wad of cash under their noses. As the bootleggers reached under the tarp of their covered wagon, they were suddenly blindsided by Reeves and the rest of the crew, with their pistols drawn and raised. Reeves, they said, was apparently so devoted to his job that on one occasion he apprehended the very minister who had baptized him for the sale of illegal liquor without so much as a second thought. Reeves's creativity and ingenuity were key in the shaping of his stellar track record. Crafty disguises and role-playing were some of the most valuable tactics in his bag of tricks. Mindful of his height and powerful stature, as well as that of his favorite stallion, he rented the smallest horse he could find that could support his weight and hunched his shoulders when approaching his targets so as to appear less imposing. Not all of his characters required the use of a horse. When he wasn't posing as a cowboy, one of his most frequently employed disguises, he donned the costume of a drifter, a farmer, or preacher, among other ostensibly harmless and approachable characters. One of his finest performances took place in the late 1870s, and it revolved around the pursuit of an unnamed pair of brother outlaws who had secretly taken shelter in their mother's house. First, Reeves parked his wagon 28 miles away from the mother's home so as to throw the fugitives and their accessory off the scent. Then he swapped his marshal's uniform for an ensemble of ill-fitting dirt-stained rags, his cuffs and pistols stowed away beneath his baggy attire, along with a frayed, floppy hat bearing three bullet holes, and he proceeded to make the strenuous trek, roughly a nine-hour and twenty-minute walk, given an average leisurely pace of three miles per hour, to the hideout. The crumbling soles of his ragged boots, which further deteriorated from the extensive hike, only helped to solidify his cover story. Reeves was greeted by the mother of the fugitives at the door. As always, he had come prepared, having concocted a story that was equal parts believable and piteous along the way. He claimed to be a fugitive, who had narrowly escaped a shootout with a deputy marshal and his posse, and had luckily managed to shake them off his trail some thirty miles away. He was dehydrated and absolutely famished, he continued, and wondered if she could spare him a meal as well as a room for the night. The unsuspecting woman was charmed by the fugitive's good manners. At the same time, his story tugged on her heartstrings, for her sons were embroiled in a similar predicament. The woman welcomed Reeves into her home, introduced him to her sons, and gave their visitor a piping hot meal. Reeves conversed with the brothers into the night, and quickly acquired their trust, so much so that the trio planned to ride off together first thing the following morning. There was even talk of possibly collaborating on a grand heist in the future. Reeves made his move as soon as the brothers, who were completely plastered, dozed off that evening. The marshal, having wisely declined the liquor that he had been offered, extracted his handcuffs and carefully shackled the wrists of the snoozing fugitives. The brothers awoke the next morning to find the barrels of two guns inches from their noses. Defeated, the groggy brothers were grudgingly escorted back to Reeves's camp. The mother of the wanted men supposedly tagged along for three miles, yanking on Reeves's arm and cursing up a storm until she eventually lost steam. Reeves was awarded an attractive sum of $5,000 for the arrests. 
While Reeves was indeed renowned for his unequaled marksmanship, the deputy made it a point to discharge his weapons only when absolutely necessary, and for the most part he only used his pistols to intimidate his charges into compliance. He preferred close-range, hand-to-hand combat, and he often relied on his agility and bare-knuckle fighting skills to subdue unarmed or disarmed fugitives. The first justifiable homicide Reeves committed in the line of duty was an incident that some now characterize as poetic justice. The episode, as recounted by Reeves's great-nephew, Judge Paul J. Brady, devolved from a seemingly routine arrest into a violent, slur-peppered shootout in a matter of seconds. The marshal, as the story goes, was closing in on his charges. A bootlegger and his armed accomplice, caught with a wagon full of illicit whiskey, when the bootlegger defiantly yelled, A black badge don't mean a damn thing to me. As he said this, his accomplice echoing his sentiments behind him, he fished out his rifle and took a clumsy swing at Reeves. Before he could land the swing, Reeves unloaded two bullets, hitting him square in the chest. The bootlegger, killed instantly, slumped over and tumbled out of the driver's seat. According to Judge Brady, Bass never forgot that first killing. Inevitably, this was far from the first or last time that Reeves would be confronted with such flagrant racism. A few years later, Reeves, who had been tasked with delivering a throng of federal prisoners to a local penitentiary, found himself on the receiving end of an abhorrent, prejudice-infused tirade spouted by a white bystander embittered by the sight of a black man bossing around his white compatriots. To make matters worse, a passing white police officer sided with the bigot. Tensions escalated, and before long both Reeves and the white policeman had their pistols drawn. A bloodbath would have ensued, but fortunately for all parties involved, a senior deputy marshal eventually diffused the situation. Although Reeves was now making a rather handsome living, he was not one to forget his ignoble roots, which played an instrumental role in the strengthening of his character. Indeed, he remained a man who embraced and championed simplicity for the rest of his life. He chose not to waste money on needlessly ornate weapons, and preferred standard and low-profile, yet effective, revolvers to flamboyant silver or nickel-plated pistols. His favorite choice of weapon was the Uberti Winchester 1873 rifle, adorned with a glossy wooden stock. His rifle aside, Reeves was rarely without a cache of three revolvers— usually Colt forty five and thirty eight fifty single-action army pistols. He also kept a double-barreled shotgun hidden in his wagon just in case. Two of his three revolvers were stowed on either side of his waist with their grips facing forward so as to draw them with ease. Reeves was a proponent of the cross-draw, for he believed it was the most efficient way of drawing. The marshal was without question a force to be reckoned with, but his unfailing courteousness and decency also set him apart from many of his brash, power-hungry colleagues. The civilians who knew Reeves described him as a good-humored, kind-hearted, and sensitive individual, and they were dazzled by his consistently debonair and well-groomed appearance. He sported neatly ironed gingham shirts and trench coats in neutral colors, paired with a high-starched collar, a stiff, wide-brimmed black hat, and gleaming, freshly buffed boots. Colleagues and civilians alike also took note of his conscientiousness and his dedication to detail. Not only were deputy marshals expected to deliver warrants, capture wanted criminals, and subpoena witnesses, they were also required to compose detailed reports for their arrests. Reeves did not allow himself to be handicapped by his illiteracy, so whenever he needed a report to be drawn up, he summoned his partner or one of his posse men, who would then jot down his words verbatim. Initially, he signed all his reports with an X, until he was at some point later taught to write his name. When it came to serving multiple warrants and subpoenas at a time, he studied the documents intently before identifying and assigning recognizable symbols to different names. The system worked swimmingly. Brett and Kate McKay, authors of a 2011 article entitled Lessons in Manliness from Bass Reeves, explained that Reeves took great pride in the fact that he never once served the wrong subpoena to the wrong person. In fact, many of the courts specially requested that their subpoenas be served by Reeves because he was so reliable. 
In addition to the feared marshal's surprisingly soft temper and gentlemanly manners, Reeves harbored a love of animals of all shapes and sizes. In one anecdote, the marshal was trotting along in Cherokee territory when he happened upon a sadistic civilian beating his dog, which had just moments ago produced a litter of puppies. The normally level-headed Reeves rode up to the man, prized the club out of his hand, and threatened to retaliate on behalf of the dog. When the frightened man relented, Reeves warned that he would be back soon enough. True to his word, the marshal returned later that day with a crate, filled it up with all the puppies along with their mother, and flicked a few silver dollars into the front porch before mounting his horse. He dropped the entire crate, excluding one puppy, which he kept for himself, to a close friend of his who promised to find them good homes. Even unlikely critters were treated well by the gentle giant. Shortly after Reeves and his crew drifted off to sleep at their camp one evening, a curious skunk snuggled up against the marshal and fell asleep. When Reeves's companions noted the late-night camp crasher the following morning, they slowly retreated so as not to agitate the skunk. Reeves, on the other hand, elected to stay put, calmly stroking the skunk's fur and tail, and spoke to the animal in calming, hushed tones. Instead of spritzing them with a mist of its noxious spray, the cheerful skunk nudged his head against Reeves's ankle, as if to thank him for a good night's rest, and scurried off into the distance. Contrary to popular belief, in particular held by those who believe Reeves to be the real-life muse behind the beloved fictional character known as the Lone Ranger, the marshal did not always travel solo. In fact, he partnered with fellow marshals and other peace officers of various ranks on a semi-regular basis. One such deputy marshal was Grant Johnson, a mixed Chickasaw Creek and African-American lawman whom some historians called the Tonto to Reeves's Lone Ranger. The duo made for a captivating sight. Johnson's stocky 5'8 frame and oversized wide-brimmed white hat with midnight black neck bandana to match mounted over a black stallion, was a stark yet complimentary contrast to Reeves's aesthetic. Like Reeves, Johnson was born into slavery and was fluent in both English and Muscogee. More importantly, the practical pair worked well together and shared compatible ethics and views, both favoring a job well done over fame, and due to their unflagging commitment to their vocation, they were highly regarded by the majority of the civilians within their realm. W. R. Mulkey, a Texas native of Cherokee descent, said of Reeves and Johnson in an interview published in 1938, Reeves and Johnson were fine men. They never used devious means for arrest. Reeves also collaborated with Deputy Marshal Jacob T. Ayers on more than one occasion. Among their most notable joint arrests was that of two peace officers, James Jones, Chief of Indian Police at the Wichita Agency in Anadarko, and a high-ranking Indian lawman named Comanche Jack. The crooked officers had been charged with the murders of Charlie Hard and James Davis, a Texas fugitive and wood camp laborer, respectively. Notwithstanding Reeves's estimable title, then unprecedented for a man of his skin color, the grounded marshal was not above demoting himself to posse man so as to acquire more knowledge from veteran officers in the field. In the early years of his career, Reeves tagged along on the pursuits captained by Deputy Marshals Robert J. Topping, Heck Thomas, Bill Tillman, Bud Ledbetter, and John H. Mershon. One of the most significant and challenging milestones in Reeves's career unfolded on December 20, 1878. The marshal had been assigned to track down Bob Dozier, a slippery farmer and hardened criminal, whose unending rap sheet consisted of fraud, cattle and horse theft, bank and storefront robberies, stagecoach holdups, and murder. Dozier was anything but a sitting duck. He was as elusive as he was clever, successfully remaining on the lam for months. Thanks to Reeves' exceptional tracking skills, however, the marshal eventually cottoned onto his trail and followed him to a densely wooded area in Cherokee territory. As luck would have it, just as Reeves and his crew were chasing Dozier and one of his partners in crime down the slope of a ravine with a gut-wrenching, precipitous drop, the ruthless storm that had been brewing overhead shattered, and a torrential surge of rain cascaded upon them. Still, Reeves, who refused to allow a change in weather to obstruct him from completing his objective, ordered his men to charge on. 
Once they reached level ground, a deafening gunshot sounded, followed by a bullet that whizzed past Reeves' left cheek. Reeves and his men dismounted, and with ringing ears scattered, ducking behind nearby trees. Reeves signaled for his posse to hold their position and awaited more gunshots. Suddenly the marshal spotted a moving blur flitting from one tree to another. Without a word, he cocked his pistol, raised his weapon to eye level, and, with impeccable timing, fired two shots in succession, striking the shadow between two trees. The shadow, as determined upon closer inspection, belonged to Dozier's partner. Dozier reacted and fired a string of gunshots in Reeves's direction. Having anticipated such a reprisal, the marshal dove to the muddy ground just in time and remained motionless, with his pistol cocked and ready. His posse men watched from behind the trees, with their guns drawn, but heeding Reeves's instructions, they maintained their positions. After several minutes of nail-biting silence interspersed with cracks of thunder and the heavy pat of rainfall, a cackling dozier who assumed that Reeves had been deserted by his posse emerged from behind his hiding place and approached what he believed to be the marshal's corpse, his limbs splayed and one of his pistols still in his grip. As soon as Dozier closed in on him, standing roughly five feet away, Reeves rolled over onto his back, pointed his pistol at the fugitive, and ordered him to drop his weapon. Startled, Dozier halted. The unblinking marshal watched his every move, and sensing the wheels turning in Dozier's head, propped himself up into a squat. The fugitive hunkered down at the same time, but Reeves beat him to the trigger. It took no more than a single discharge of the marshal's weapon as the bullet penetrated Dozier's neck. He bled out on the spot. Reeves was so resourceful that he even managed to turn his illiteracy to his advantage, as exemplified in the following account. One summer afternoon in the early 1880s, the marshal crossed paths with a pair of brusque, ill-mannered men who demanded to know if he was the famous Bass Reeves. Reeves, who was on the way home to see his family, politely dismissed their claims. The outlaw's suspicions, unfortunately, did not falter. They drew their guns, forced him to dismount, loaded him onto their wagon, and set out to search for someone who could confirm the marshal's identity. Little did they know, Reeves, who was prepared for such an event and could therefore retain his cool, had already initiated a mental rehearsal for his backup plan. His captors wandered around the town for several hours, but could not find anyone to corroborate their claims. Even so, the outlaws were positive that they had nabbed the right man, so they decided to ride out to a clearing, where they planned to dispose of the marshal. The marshal's smug captors asked Reeves for his final words, to which he countered with a special request. He was granted permission to retrieve a letter from his satchel that his wife had supposedly written for him, and he entreated his captors to read her comforting words aloud, for he could not read. Reeves presented a folded piece of parchment to the captor closest to him, but once the captor extended his hand to take the letter, Reeves tossed the letter aside, sprang forth, and seized him by the throat with one hand. Pulling the man's pistol with his other, he pressed the barrel up against the man's temple. Demoralized, the man wilted in his chokehold. His other captor, apparently paralyzed in a state of shock, also dropped his weapon. This letter trick came in handy on many an occasion throughout Reeves's career. At this point, Reeves was certain that his unpredictable yet thoroughly rewarding line of work was his true calling. Apart from his passion for and tenacious drive to maintain law and order, the hidden, adrenaline-fueled risks and close calls involved in his thrilling chases and encounters most likely appealed to him on some subconscious level. One of Reeves's most memorable close calls took place in the spring of 1884. While tracking down a company of four outlaws along the Seminole Whiskey Trail, he was waylaid by a trio of brothers locally known as the Brunter Boys. The Brunter Boys, also wanted men, were a wily, dangerous threesome with criminal records that featured horse wrestling and highway robbery, along with other violent crimes. And they were allegedly involved in multiple cold murder cases dotted along the Indian Territory. The Brunter Boys, who did not recognize the marshal, assumed that they had found an easy target, but Reeves knew precisely who they were. Initially, Reeves played along and complied when they commanded him to dismount. One of the brothers prodded Reeves with the stock of his gun and demanded that he disclose his name and intentions on their so-called turf. The marshal made no effort to conceal his identity. 
You can call me Deputy Marshal Reeves, he intoned, flashing his badge, and I come to arrest you. Staring down the flabbergasted trio, he continued, Would you be so kind as to tell me what day it is today? What's it to you? One of the brothers piped up, his eyebrows raised. Why, said Reeves, I need the date so I can get cracking on them arrest papers, of course. The wide-eyed brothers looked at one another with sheer disbelief and bowled over with laughter. That was the marshal's cue. Reeves grabbed the muzzle of the firearm belonging to the Brunter brother closest to him and pushed it away, while drawing his Colt forty-five in the blink of an eye and shooting at the other two brothers, who collapsed in their places. The surviving Brunter brother frantically fired his revolver three times, but the bullets flew into the air. A short tussle ensued, until Reeves disarmed the last brother and decked him with a blow to the side of his head with the butt of his pistol. Whether the final Brunter brother survived this butt-stroke remains a matter of dispute. In most accounts, the pistol whip cracked the Brunter's head open, and he bled out. According to Judge Brady's version of the events, however, the third brother was arrested without further incident and eventually recovered from his injuries. At least one of Reeves's arrests was the product of dumb luck. A few weeks after his shootout with the Brunter brothers, the marshal was commissioned to hunt down two fugitive horse thieves named Frank Buck and John Bruner, but the details of their descriptions were scant at best. By pure chance, Reeves came across a dubious-looking duo, and while he could not unequivocally confirm their identities, he heeded the gnawing feeling in his gut and approached them. The marshal identified himself and asked if the gentleman knew where to find the men listed on the warrants. Reeves noted the men's stiffening shoulders and the telling eye contact they exchanged before offering to serve as his guides. He followed the pair, who headed north, and the three men pitched up a camp at noon. The guides proceeded to go through the motions of igniting a fire, and Reeves kept his eyes on them. As one of the guides later identified as Bruner hovered over the kindling pile, the marshal spotted him furtively reaching for his holster. Reeves lunged forth, wrenched the revolver from Bruner's grasp, and simultaneously unsheathed his own weapon. Recalling the imminent threat behind him, Reeves peered over his shoulder and saw the dumbstruck Buck fumbling around for his own pistol. Before Buck could level his weapon, the marshal pulled the trigger of his colt and shot him dead. Bruner was captured, shoved into the cell of the tumbleweed wagon, and escorted to the sheriff's office at Fort Smith. Reeves's next major mission was assigned to him not long after. The marshal, who was traveling alongside a posseman, Floyd Wilson, had been instructed to serve and apprehend a notorious Texan outlaw named Jim Webb. Webb was a racist and depraved foreman at the Washington McClish Ranch, a sprawling estate that stretched from the Red River to the Arbuckle Mountains in Chickasaw Territory, situated in what is now Love County, Oklahoma. The foreman was accused of slaying his neighbor, an African-American circuit preacher surnamed Seward, in cold blood in the springtime of the previous year. Seward, Webb claimed with not the slightest iota of evidence, had intentionally allowed his controlled brush fire to spread to the neighboring ranch, inflicting serious damage on the Washington McClish property. Therefore, he had to pay the price. Reverend Seward was not Webb's first victim, either, as eleven others in the Brazos River area in Texas were said to have died at his hands. That fateful evening, Reeves and Wilson strode up to a remote ranch on horseback, dressed as cowboys. The undercover officers noted that there were only three men at the eerily desolate ranch, the ranch cook, a cowboy named Frank Smith, and Webb himself. The displaced cowboys tipped their caps and asked if they could trouble the cook for a spot of breakfast, as they had not eaten in over a day. To their disappointment, Webb was immediately skeptical of their intentions. The cowboys continued to shuffle toward the porch, but came skidding to a halt when they noticed Webb and Smith fidgeting with their revolvers. Despite their transparent distrust of these cowboys, Webb and Smith invited them into the ranch, and with that, alarm bells began to toll. Upon entering the dining room, Webb gestured for the pair to have a seat. It would just be a moment, said Smith, who assured them that the cook would whip them up something in no time. After a spell of uncomfortable small talk, Reeves cleared his throat and asked if he could pop out to feed their horses. Webb, still staring daggers at Reeves, acknowledged him with a grunt, and without saying a word, he followed the marshal out to the stable. 
The marshal shared fabricated but credible stories about life on the road, and he propped his rifle against a nearby corn crib as he tended to his stallion, hoping to give the impression of a textbook cowboy. Webb, however, was not buying what he was selling. As soon as Reeves returned to the dining room, Webb beckoned Smith over to the other room and shut the door, and a muffled round of furious whispering ensued. The ticking time bomb was just seconds away from detonating. Reeves ordered Wilson to drop his fork, pulled him to his feet, and gave him a quick rundown of the plan. Wilson would make sure to keep Smith occupied. Webb was his. Webb and Smith re-entered their room with their revolvers drawn, only to find themselves mirrored by Reeves and Wilson. The four of them squared off for several minutes, one party daring the other to make the first move. A fraction of a second and a knee-jerk reaction was all it took. The static silence was interrupted by screeching wheels in the distance. When Webb glanced out the window, Reeves pounced on him, sealing off his windpipe with one hand and swatting his revolver away with the other. Reeves tightened his grip around Webb's throat and drew his colt with his free hand. Webb eventually stopped squirming and waved his arms in surrender. Meanwhile, Reeves's partner had come down with a severe case of performance anxiety. Wilson remained frozen in place, allowing for an easy counterattack. Smith shot at Reeves twice, but the marshal dodged both bullets. Not missing a beat, Reeves, who was still flinging his captive around like a rag doll, aimed his pistol at Smith and fired once. The bullet ripped through Smith's abdomen, leaving him dead before he hit the ground. As Reeves chained Webb's wrists, a sheepish Wilson scuttled toward Smith with his own handcuffs in his still-shaking hands. The glowing reputation of the illustrious marshal continued to soar to new heights. There was not a single criminal west of the Mississippi River who the deputy marshal could not retrieve. Petty thieves and battle-scarred career criminals alike quaked in their boots at the mere mention of the marshal's name. On September 11, 1885, Reeves was assigned to the cases of horse bandits Fayette Barnett and Bell Starr, one of the most notorious and unique outlaws of them all. Born Myra Maybell Shirley, Starr was a southern girl who knew her way around horses and guns. Through her association with other outlaws like the Starr clan and the James and Younger gang, Shirley entered law enforcement's radar herself. Shirley would get her famous nickname Bell Starr as a result of marrying outlaw Sam Starr, and it was that name that found itself plastered all across posters in the West. Though she was a crack shot and a renowned rider, Bell Starr was usually engaged in lesser crimes, like stealing horses, rustling, fencing stolen goods, and hiding other outlaws. She also became infamous for rumors about the various outlaws she romanced, which allegedly included Cole Younger. Ultimately, Bell Starr likely would have been forgotten if not for the mysterious nature of her death and the attempts of dime novel writers to exaggerate her story and turn her into the female equivalent of Jesse James. On February 3, 1889, Starr was ambushed and murdered while riding home, and it's still unclear who decided to blast her in the back and head with shotguns. That might have been the end of her story, but just months after her unsolved murder, dime novelist Richard K. Fox published Bella Starr, the Bandit Queen, or The Female Jesse James, which breathed new life into her legacy. Since then, Belle Starr has been remembered as one of the most famous women of the Wild West, and she has been portrayed in books, a 1941 movie named after her, and several television shows like Maverick and even Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman. Despite her dodgy profession, an unlikely platonic friendship blossomed between the marshal and the repeat offender. Their camaraderie dispels yet another common misconception about the devoted deputy marshal. Reeves was not an unreasonably judgmental man, and he had no qualms about befriending lawbreakers. As far as he was concerned, his job was to deliver the names printed on the warrants handed to him, and it was not his place to judge. At the same time, once a warrant was assigned to him, not even the most profound of relationships could stand in his way, and Reeves would soon prove that blood was not thicker than water in that regard. In September 1885, Reeves stopped by Starr's home and tipped her off to the freshly issued warrant in her name. It would be wise for Starr to turn herself in as soon as possible, the marshal advised her, to save them both the trouble. If she failed to do so, Reeves warned her gently, she could be assured that he would not stop until he had tossed her behind bars himself. At first, Starr panicked, 
disconcerted by flashbacks to her previous prison stints, and fled town. Reeves made good on his promise and set off to track her down, but the experienced fugitive managed to evade the marshal's radar for a few weeks. Eventually, the sleepless star, bedeviled by consuming terror and guilt, threw in the towel. She could no longer bear constantly looking over her shoulder, expecting to see the marshal's stern face on every corner. Starr voluntarily turned herself in at the sheriff's office in Fort Smith on January 21, 1886. When asked what had inspired her change of heart, Bell replied that she did not propose to be dragged around by some federal deputy. By now, Reeves had more than merited his nickname, the Indomitable Marshal. An excerpt from the Daily Ardmoret article published on January 18, 1910, told readers, At different times his hat was shot in two, buttons were shot from his coat, his hat punctured, and his bridle reins shot from his hand, but no bullet ever touched his body. Reeves may have escaped injury on many fortunate occasions, but his good luck wouldn't always last. Trials and Errors I have ever had the single aim of justice in view. No justice who is influenced by any other consideration is fit for the bench. Do equal and exact justice is my motto, and I have often said to the grand jury, Permit no innocent man to be punished, but let no guilty man escape. Attributed to Judge Isaac Parker the disastrous episode that threatened to unravel the formidable career that Reeves had worked tirelessly to build over the years unfolded on April 9, 1884. The deputy had set out on the first stretch of an extensive 300-mile journey across the Creek, Chickasaw, and Seminole territories in late February, and by April his traveling party had grown. In addition to wagon driver Johnny Brady, who was Reeves's 14-year-old nephew and his cook, William Leach, Reeves had five prisoners in his custody, four Native Americans from varying tribes, and a Creek freedman named James Grayson, all of whom were charged with different crimes. Grayson's wife and children, who were anxious about the family patriarch's failing health, followed in tow. The original party was one passenger light, as Deputy Floyd Wilson had been called away, to attend to a pressing matter some thirty miles away. Shortly before supper that evening, Reeves and his posse decided to set up camp along the Canadian River. A long day lay ahead of them, for they were scheduled to cross into Seminole land. Needless to say, the accounts surrounding the controversial incident continue to be contested. The following is a breakdown of one such retelling of the incident. The evening started out pleasantly enough, Reeves, Brady, Leach, and the Graysons were relaxing around a crackling campfire, having just consumed a wholesome meal that Leach had prepared for them, while the rest of the prisoners remained shackled in a nearby tent. Reeves and Leach were quipping back and forth when the former cracked a joke about the latter's cooking, which was not well received. Minutes later, the vindictive cook snatched up Reeves's puppy, presumably the same one that he had rescued, and funneled a still-gurgling skillet of grease down its throat. The poor dog died about an hour later. Enraged by Leach's cruelty, Reeves grabbed his Winchester rifle and shot the cook in the neck. Leach staggered backwards with blood gushing out of his severed artery and landed on top of the campfire. In one particularly gruesome version of the story, it was only after Reeves had stamped out the flames on the corpse that Leach's nearly decapitated head was hanging by the flesh of his neck. He then swung his leg and kicked the corpse with such force that the head snapped off and rolled back into the fire. In most other accounts, the harrowing incident was portrayed as a regrettable accident. Though clearly shaken, Reeves, who was made to file a report upon his return to Fort Smith on April 24th, recounted the event with the utmost professionalism. He was in the midst of clawing out a forty-five shell that had jammed inside his rifle and failed to notice that Leach had wandered into the line of fire. As Reeves was doing so, his rifle discharged of its own accord, and the stray bullet struck Leach in the neck. He claimed that he hastened over to Leach, dragged him out of the fire, ordered his companions to fetch a doctor at once, and did his best to plug the gaping wound. Much to his dismay, all efforts were futile. As unsettled as Reeves was by this traumatizing tragedy, he regrouped, cleared his conscience to the best of his ability, and soldiered on with his job. 
He bore no resentment toward the institution of law and order itself, and he had full faith in the system, despite what the sobering statistics regarding the convictions of black men indicated. Considering his boundless knowledge of the Disappearing Act and his command on hunting, tracking, and living off-grid, vanishing without a trace would have been child's play for Reeves. Even so, he could not find it within him to leave his family and his responsibilities in the lurch, and he was resolved to never violate his oath. A few weeks after Reeves apprehended Jim Webb, he learned that one of Webb's confidants, Jim Bywaters, had posted his $17,000 bond. Webb, not surprisingly, ditched his murder trial and skipped town. Thus Reeves put on his trademark pinch front hat, saddled up, and returned to the road with the same posse minus Leech. In June 1884, Reeves and his posse tracked Webb to the Bywaters General Store, stashed away in the foothills of the Arbuckle Mountain Range. As Reeves and his men galloped toward the store, Webb, who had spotted them from a distance, clambered out a window and darted toward his horse, which was hitched to a tree a few hundred feet away. Reeves rode up and yanked his reins between Webb and the tree in a bid to intercept him, but the armed fugitive shot at the marshal, firing a total of four shots. The first bullet blew off one of the buttons on Reeves' coat. The second bullet became lodged in his saddle horn. The third bullet detached his reins from his bridle, and the final bullet whizzed past his ear. Undaunted, Reeves leapt off his spooked stallion with his Winchester in hand and fired three consecutive shots. Two of these bullets pierced Webb's chest, and the fugitive hit the ground. Reeves jogged up to the fallen fugitive with Bywaters and John Cantrell, eyewitnesses following closely behind. The bullet holes, upon closer examination, lay about a half an inch apart. It was later revealed that Bywaters had scribbled down Webb's last words, complete with his dying wish and a confession, on the back of a freight receipt. "'Give me your hand, Bass,' the gasping fugitive croaked. "'You are a brave, brave man. I want you to accept my revolver and scabbard as a present, and you must accept them. Take it, for with it I've killed eleven men, four of them in the Indian Territory, and I expected you to make the twelfth. Reeves's career was put on pause in early January 1886, when Deputy Marshal G. J. B. Frere knocked on his front door and extended to him a warrant with his name. Reeves held out his wrists without complaint and was taken to the federal jail, where his bail was set at $3,000. In the months that followed, Reeves scrimped and saved, ultimately managing to pool together enough money to post his bond on June 15th. He then assembled a team comprised of the most reputable lawyers he could find, and together they went to work on constructing his defense. It was the deputy marshal's wish to be exonerated from all charges, but he knew that his fate rested in the hands of an almost entirely white jury, so he prepared himself to accept either outcome. Reeves's lawyer compiled a list of the prosecution's potential angles, along with their prospective counterstatements. For starters, although Reeves's superior, Marshal Thomas Bowles, advocated the deputy marshal's innocence, Democratic President Grover Cleveland had begun to purge previously appointed Republican officials and replacing them with Democratic officials of his choosing. In October, Bowles was made to retire from his post as U.S. Marshal for the Western District of Arkansas and was succeeded by John Carroll. Carroll, in turn, selected G. J. B. Frere to lead the inquiry into Leach's death. Unlike Bowles, Carroll, a former colonel in the Confederacy who allegedly held an innate grudge against blacks, became swayed by the rumors swirling around Reeves's name and was convinced that the cook's death was no accident. The press, which sensationalized Leach's death and unabashedly fingered Reeves as the villain, did not help his case. One local publication in Little Rock, for example, released an article entitled Caught Up With, An Ex-Marshal's Misdeeds Brought to Light, which accused the murderous official of shooting his cook dead for some trivial offense and covering his tracks so effectively as to retain his commission. The author of another article published in the Fort Smith Times presented another warped rendition of the events. Leach, the reporter claimed, had been preparing supper when a dog, identified as Leach's, was seduced by the scent of frying meat and stuck its nose into the skillet for a sniff. 
Reeves supposedly grew irate, blamed the dog for contaminating the meat with his drool, punted the defenseless dog to the side and attempted to shoot it. That was when Leech wedged himself between them to protect the dog. Reeves's face darkened and infuriated with his cook for defying his orders, he aimed his rifle at Leech and fired, killing him in cold blood. Other newspapers quickly hopped aboard the smear campaign. One reporter described the deputy as a diabolical madman once accused of sexual harassment who often held kangaroo courts and extorted sums of money from prisoners for small imaginary offenses. Reeves's trial began on October 11, 1887, with his case presided over by Judge Parker. The marshal was represented by a team directed by a former colleague and old friend, U.S. Attorney W. H. H. Clayton. To Reeves's relief, the prosecution and ongoing smear campaign ultimately failed to besmirch his character, but it was not for lack of trying. Mrs. Grayson and Toby Hill, one of the Native American prisoners he had detained, served as two of the prosecution's eleven witnesses, and both their testimonies reinforced the Fort Smith Times' version of events. Thankfully, when pressed by the defense, both witnesses backpedaled. They admitted that Reeves and Leach had gotten along famously up until the incident, and that the heated exchange they'd had may very well have been playful banter. Moreover, Mrs. Grayson divulged that she had seen Reeves attempting to dislodge the cartridge from his rifle with a pocket knife. Reeves's ruling was secured courtesy of Clayton's eloquence and the team's powerful, well-organized defense, which featured confident cross-examinations and razor-sharp rebuttals. The ten trustworthy witnesses and strong pieces of evidence procured by the defense, along with Reeves's own unshakable comprehensive testimony, also played no small role in Reeves's vindication. Edward Hunt, the foreman of the jury, delivered the not guilty verdict on behalf of his peers on Sunday, October 15th. Reeves was reinstated and his badge returned immediately after his acquittal, but the acquittal came with strings attached. Reeves was, by 1887, one of the highest earning officers in his field, raking in between three and five thousand dollars, roughly ninety five to a hundred and sixty thousand dollars today, after the twenty five percent apportioned to his superior, a year. To put this in perspective, a deputy marshal on average took home $500, approximately $16,000 per annum. The astronomical legal expenses he incurred, however, dealt him a devastating financial blow. By the end of his trial, Reeves had nearly depleted his once substantial bank account, and he was left with no other alternative but to sell his home in Van Buren. Reeves and his family relocated to an older, less spacious cabin in Fort Smith. He never did succeed in recouping his lost wealth. It took another two years or so before Reeves achieved yet another highlight in his career. This was the year that the marshal, who had been in pursuit of Tom Story and his lackeys since 1884, outwitted the conniving gang once and for all. During this time, Story, the ringleader of the gang, along with Kinch West, Peg Leg Jim, and Long Henry, swiped unattended stallions across the Indian Territory in droves and pawned them off in Texas from their headquarters in the Chickasaw Enclave. In 1889, the Story Gang flipped the script by rounding up a horde of horses and mules from a Texan rancher named George Delaney and speeding off to the Indian Territory in a quest to land new buyers. A warrant was issued for Story's arrest about a week later, and Reeves was assigned to the case. Delaney, the victim, insisted on playing posse men, and Reeves, a veritable expert in the geography of the parts, deduced that Story would most likely be crossing the Red River at the Delaware Bend crossing. With that, the pair ventured forth to follow his hunch. Reeves and Delaney camped out along the Delaware Bend crossing and laid in wait for four days. On the afternoon of the fourth day, Story came trotting along the bend with two of Delaney's precious mules. Imagine Story's bewilderment and sinking feeling when Reeves and Delaney sprang out of the thicket with their pistols drawn. Reeves ordered Story to dismount his wagon, displaying the warrant for his arrest in his free hand. Like many before him, Story refused to come quietly and made the fatal mistake of reaching for his weapon. Story was fast, but once again Reeves was faster. With the fugitive's revolver only halfway out of its holster, 
Reeves fired twice from some sixty feet away. The first bullet struck Story in the gut, about twelve inches above his belt buckle. The second shot, fired for good measure, was embedded in the outlaw's temple. The Tom Story gang disbanded soon after the ringleader's demise. On June fourteenth that same year, Joseph Lundy, a deputy marshal based in Kansas, was gunned down by a gaggle of horse thieves in the Potawatomi Nation. Reeves and his posse rolled up at the scene days later and discovered damning evidence that pointed to a trio of Seminole Indians, one prince, Nokus Harjo, and Bill Wolf. Arrest warrants were issued by the newly appointed U.S. Marshal Jacob Yose on June 20th, and when the desperados caught wind of these warrants in question, they quickly made themselves scarce and remained in hiding for quite some time. Marshal Yose received a note from Eufaula, dated December 30th. The scrap of paper, as recited by Reeves, simply read, Have got the three men who killed Deputy Marshal Lundy. Not mentioned were the five other prisoners in Reeves's custody implicated in non-related crimes. Interestingly enough, while there has been no substantial evidence to prove that Reeves egregiously mistreated his prisoners, several of his captives shined a light on one of the deputy marshal's eccentricities, which at the least amused them and on other occasions made them uncomfortable. Western historian Ron W. Fisher explained, At times he would have a number of prisoners, all of whom he would seat on a log to which he would fasten their shackles. He would walk up and down before them and preach the gospel. Maybe it was because he was a deacon in the church to which he belonged in Van Buren. Mostly, he would speak to them of right and wrong and would do so emphatically. It was as though he wanted them to admit their sins and repent. In April 1890, Reeves made the headlines again with another high-profile arrest. The lawman had been commissioned to capture a high-ranking Seminole named Tosa Luna, otherwise known by his alias Greenleaf, who stood accused of robbing and slaughtering four Native Americans and three white men. Greenleaf had supposedly been on the lam for eighteen years and had never known the sensation of handcuffs until Reeves came along. An article in the April 28, 1890 issue of Little Rock's Arkansas Gazette reported, Deputy U.S. Marshal Reeves brought in twelve prisoners from the Indian country today, among them Greenleaf. Reeves was in his neighborhood and learned that Greenleaf had just come into the country with a load of whiskey. He located him at night, got near enough to hear the Indians whooping and firing their pistols. He waited until near daylight and then moved up close to the house. Just at daylight, he and his posse charged up, jumped the fence, and Greenleaf, fully awake, saw they had him covered and surrendered. After his capture, people who had known him long doubted it and flocked to see if it was really so. With a stark lack of concrete evidence, however, prosecutors failed to make the murder charges stick, so Greenleaf was only charged with the possession and sale of whiskey and sentenced to 18 months in prison, which he served at the Detroit House of Corrections. 1890 would have proved to be something of a year of redemption for Reeves had it not been for his encounter with a Cherokee outlaw named Ned Christie. In Christie, Reeves finally met his match. Christie, along with Charlie Bobtail, Bub Trainer, and John Paris, had been charged with the first-degree murder of Deputy U.S. Marshal Daniel Maples three years prior. But the Cherokee fugitive, like Greenleaf, was excruciatingly difficult to apprehend and remained the only one at large, even managing to sidestep Heck Thomas and other veteran officers. On November 27, 1890, Reeves and his posse pinned down Christie's coordinates and surrounded his hideout somewhere along the Cherokee Hills near Benita, Oklahoma, colloquially referred to as Ned's Fort Mountain. Under Reeves's instruction, the posse men lined Christie's cabin with kindling and set the place ablaze so as to literally smoke him out and to prevent the fugitive from giving them the slip. Only much later, when the flames had long fizzled out, did they realize that Christie had done just that. Reeves and his crew sifted through charred furniture and searched every nook and cranny of the cabin, but Christie was nowhere to be found. In January 1891, newspapers published erroneous accounts claiming that Christie had killed the indestructible deputy Marshal Reeves in Tahlequah. The same newspapers, of course, retracted their stories a few days later when Reeves was found to be alive, well, and unscathed, having been 150 miles away from Tahlequah at the time of his alleged death. 
Christie was himself killed at Fort Mountain by way of the dynamite and cannon wheeled in by the feds on November 2, 1892. Reeves' Final Years Maybe the law ain't perfect, but it's the only one we got, and without it, we got nothing. Attributed to Bass Reeves There were some things, it seemed, that were a fate worse than death. In 1893, Reeves and his family departed from Fort Smith and moved to Paris, Texas, where he was instated at the local federal court, which presided over matters within the bulk of the Choctaw and Chickasaw land. The Texan branch Reeves was assigned to was situated in Calvin, which was Choctaw territory. In accordance with the local law, the deputy marshal from that point forward would deliver most of his prisoners to the federal office in Paul's Valley, which was on Chickasaw turf. All hearings and trials would proceed in Paul's Valley, and only in special cases were criminals transported to the Paris courts. 1896 was a particularly torturous year for Reeves, for this was the year he lost his wife Nellie Jenny, who was no older than 46, and his longtime friend and colleague, Judge Parker. The deputy marshal slipped into a deep depression, crushed by the untimely loss of his wife of 32 years, and forced to mourn the demise of one of the fairest and most virtuous justices he had ever known. When asked about his thoughts on the death of his dear friend years later, Reeves replied, Parker was a mighty powerful man that had done a lot of good, according to what the Bible said. He sure knew him some Bible. You know, he was named after the old prophet Isaac. Adding insult to injury, the nation as a whole was regressing in the struggle for racial equality. Six months before Parker's death, the U.S. Supreme Court inaugurated a new norm on May 18, 1896, with their ruling in Plessy v. Ferguson. The ruling legalized racial segregation laws for all public establishments and facilities, an acutely discriminatory policy masked by the paradoxical term separate but equal. In 1897, about a year after the contentious ruling, Reeves was transferred back to Oklahoma, this time to the tiny creek town of Wetumpka, which was within the jurisdiction of the Northern District Federal Court, where he was placed under the supervision of Marshal Leo Bennett. The status quo had also been interrupted by the Congressional Act of 1895, which saw the institution of three district courts in the Indian Territory the Northern District at Muskogee, the Central District at McAllister, and the Southern District at Ardmore. These courts saw their powers patently diminished. They would no longer be receiving cases with the death penalty on the table, and for that matter, they could not even try civil cases concerning more than $100. The rising animosity toward black people inflicted by those who were empowered by the new segregation laws only caused Reeves further aggravation. A part of him felt betrayed by the system, especially considering the decades of phenomenal service he had provided for the authorities, as well as his federal citizens of every color and creed. His world, it seemed, was falling apart. While Nellie continued to hold a special place in Reeves's heart for the rest of his days, he found new love at the break of the twentieth century. He married a fifty-year-old Cherokee widow named Winnie J. Sumter in 1900, and he gained a stepdaughter in Estelle Simmer. The newfound happiness he had chanced upon, however, was only fleeting. In less than two years, he would have to face off with what was possibly the most dauntingly difficult decision he had made in his life. It was the summer of 1902. Reeves had just hitched his horse to the front of Marshal Bennett's office and was unloading two prisoners from the back of his tumbleweed wagon when he was suddenly summoned by his superior. Puzzled, Reeves handed off the prisoners to one of his colleagues and entered the building. The distraught look on Bennett's face alarmed him, but it was the shocking news the marshal delivered that made his heart sink. A warrant had been issued for Reeves's 22-year-old son, Benny Houston Reeves, who was wanted for murder. To begin with, it was no secret that the marriage between Benny and his wife Cassie had been on the rocks for years. Several years prior, Benny, who was employed as a barber, closed up shop early one afternoon and returned home to surprise his wife. The surprise, however, was all his, for he inadvertently caught his wife having an affair with another man. According to some sources, 
it may have been Reeves himself who planted the idea of murder in his impressionable son's mind. When Benny shared his despair with his father a few days later, and admitting to having already forgiven his two-timing wife, Reeves stood up from his chair and slammed his fist on the table, yelling, I'd have shot the man and whipped the living god out of her. Several months later, Benny caught Cassie yet again with another strange man. The man attempted to flee, but Benny seized him by the throat and beat him to a pulp. He then turned to his sobbing wife, shot her dead, and fled the scene. Bennett expressed his sympathies for Reeves and assured him that he would assign the warrant to a dependable deputy marshal of his choosing. Reeves paced around Bennett's office for several minutes before finally breaking his silence. He thanked the marshal for extending to him such courtesy, but his mind had been made up. Give me the writ, he barked. Even now he staunchly refused to breach his oath. His son had committed an unforgivable crime, and therefore, like any other man, he too would have to pay. Reeves tracked down his son in no more than fourteen days. Benny, as the story goes, was curled up in his tent, fast asleep, and did not notice the shadow looming over him. He awoke to the unmistakable sound of his father's booming voice. "'You are no more my son,' declared Reeves. "'You committed a crime, and I have a warrant in my pocket for you, a bench warrant to bring you in dead or alive, and I'm going to take you in today, one way or the other. You can come out with your hands up, or else your whole body will be down. Benny, his eyes still bloodshot from his deep slumber, exited the tent at once. Under the standard query, where and by whom were you arrested, Benny scrawled the following, Muskogee, by Bass Reeves, my father, who was deputy marshal. Benny was eventually tried and convicted for the crime, and he was sent to Fort Leavenworth Penitentiary in Kansas to serve his time, where despite his declaration of disownment, Reeves visited him, rain or shine, on a regular basis. Benny was ultimately released from prison on good behavior after twelve years. Reeves remained thoroughly committed to his duties, even after the heartbreaking arrest of his flesh and blood, once again demonstrating his passion for law and justice. Months after Benny's arrest, Reeves and one of his partners were applauded for extinguishing a race war in Bragg's, Texas, which involved twenty-five in some cases twenty-four, arrestees, both white and black. Reeves's heroism shined again about a year or so later when he single-handedly confronted a lynch mob near one of the cattle ranches in Ugalala, then in the Cherokee Territory. Several of the ranchers there, who were accusing a black man of stealing one of their heifers, had taken justice into their own hands. Without uttering a single word, Reeves charged toward the mob at full speed. Once the rabble dispersed, he proceeded to saw through the noose around the man's neck, made room for him on his saddle, and galloped away. He later delivered the man to the nearest sheriff's office so the courts could decide his fate. On November 16, 1907, Oklahoma was formally recognized as an official state of its own. Not only were racial segregation laws further enforced, but the policing departments of the Indian Territory were subsumed by the new state government, and much of the federal police force was dismissed. Reeves was among those let go, but the 69-year-old deputy marshal was not yet ready to retire, so he went on to accept the lowly position of a beat cop in the consolidated Muskogee police force. Even with his salt-and-pepper hair and beard and a few wrinkles on the corners of his eyes, Reeves was as agile in both body and mind as he had ever been, and according to his colleagues, he remained as quick of trigger as in the days when the gunmen were in demand. By then, however, the deputy marshal's days were numbered. He remained in the Muskogee police force until the late fall of 1909, when he was forced to retire on account of his now fragile health. Reeves passed away from complications stemming from Bright's disease, a disorder of the kidneys, on January 10, 1910. He died peacefully in his Muskogee home, surrounded by loved ones. By the end of his career, Reeves had been credited with the arrest of over 3,000 wanted men and had shot down at least fourteen outlaws in the line of duty, all in self-defense. An article published by the Muskogee Phoenix, two days later, paid a powerful tribute to the spectacular life and career of Deputy Marshal Bass Reeves. In the history of the early days of eastern Oklahoma, the name of Bass Reeves had a place in the front rank among those who cleanse out the old Indian territory of outlaws and desperadoes. No story of the conflict of government's officers with those outlaws can be complete without the mention of the man who died yesterday. During that time, 
he was sent to arrest some of the most desperate characters that ever infested Indian territory and endangered life and peace in its borders. He was a unique character, absolutely fearless and knowing no master but duty. The placing of a writ in his hands meant that the letter of the law would be fulfilled. He faced death a hundred times with the simple faith that some men have who believe that they are in the care of special providence when they are doing right. This has been Bass Reeves, The Life and Legacy of the Wild West's First Black Deputy Marshal. Written by Charles River Editors. Narrated by Ray Howard. Copyright 2020 by Charles River Editors. Production Copyright 2020 by Charles River Editors. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.